Food shortages and ridiculously high food prices are on display every time we go to the grocery store, and they appear to be getting worse. We hear about supply chain issues being the cause. In researching this issue, I found that there are deeper issues inside of the supply chain that are making food supply worse. I will explain what I found out. My name is Ben Repond. Today is July 12th, 2022. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. Here is the connection that I want to establish. Food supplies are rapidly diminishing. This means that unless this changes course, access to food will become greatly diminished. The processes that must be in place and work correctly is essential to get food from the growers all the way to the grocery stores. There are signs that this is diminishing or breaking down. So many things are going in the wrong direction at the same time. If this continues, it will have a devastating effect on our economy and our way of life. The first thing I want to cover is the following. A law was passed in California in 2019 that would require independent uh, truckers to become employees of companies. The net effect of this was that if this became law, about 70,000 truckers would lose their jobs. I don't know if that was intended or an unintended consequence, but it is the byproduct of this particular law. The law was appealed, or the, the, the law that was passed, the bill that was passed became law and was appealed by the Truckers Association. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court last week declined to hear the case. My guess is they probably said that's a state issue. Threw it back to the state of California and what that means is that the law therefore stands and is now in effect and will be probably immediately causing the elimination of 70,000 truckers in the state of California. This happens when we can least afford it. And here is another glitch in the supply chain. And trucks and truckers are an important part of the supply chain. If we don't have trucks and truckers, we don't have enough food to eat. California produces 30% of the food that we eat. This food is trucked to processing plants and warehouses all over the country. This is the food that we're used to buying at the grocery store. I'll play a clip for you. And uh, this is from the Bay Area CBS affiliate. But first, independent truckers bracing for a new state law that could put them out of business and make the supply chain problems even worse. Good evening, I'm Sarah Donchi. And I'm Ryan Yamamoto. The U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear a challenge to the state's gig worker bill, throwing a wrench in the trucking industry that increasingly relies on independent truckers. AB5, known as the gig worker bill, was passed back in 2019. The state law reclassifies independent contractors as employees, but until now, a law to prevent it any impact on the trucking industry. So that suit claimed that the law would devastate the industry. John Ramos talked to independent truckers and business owners who say the impact could be disastrous. AB5 was intended to give transport workers more workplace protections, but for truckers who own and operate their own rigs, it may be the end of the road, and that's going to affect all of us. On Thursday, the U.S. Supreme Court made news again, this time by refusing to hear a challenge by California truckers to the new law that requires truck drivers to be employees of the trucking companies they do business with. This ruling really took everybody uh, off guard, especially the way they, um, at, at the speed that they kicked this back, you know, essentially made it law. 
The problem is nearly all of the state's goods are transported by truck, many of which are owned and operated by individual drivers. That's especially the case at the Port of Oakland. And there's 9,000 trucks that serve the port on a daily basis, and 90% of them are independent contractors. So this is a big, big impact. Bill Abudi owns AB Trucking in Oakland. He employs his own drivers, but also uses independent contractors to handle overflow business, which just became illegal. Abudi says he won't be able to use trucks owned by the drivers anymore. It just doesn't work. You own your own truck, it's your truck. I can't take possession of it and start using it. In a case like my company, we just eliminate owner operators and, and just reduce the, the workload. That's a disaster for Hedayatollah Abrahimi, who just bought his own truck a month ago. He, like other owner operators, spent tens of thousands of dollars to not be someone's employee. Do you feel a sense of pride in owning your own truck? Oh yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> that's my my own truck. My, you know, working for myself. Now his truck will be useless unless he wants to become his own trucking company, booking his own loads and dealing with the port bureaucracy. Are those all the things that the trucking company does for you now? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. They arrange everything and they they, they talk to the big companies, to the port, everything and they take all the loads for us. So you don't have to do any of the paperwork yourself? No, 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 not the paperwork. His dream of being a truck driver just got a lot more complicated. But industry experts predict many won't stay in California, which will only make the supply chain problems worse and the cost of everything in the state even more expensive. It's gonna adversely affect everybody and with inflation being as high as it is, this is gonna put inflationary pressure on uh, consumer. In Oakland, John Ramos, KPIX5. No one seems to know how the new law will be enforced or who will enforce it. And legally, it is supposed to go into effect in just a few days. Several news sources are starting to mention shortages in diesel and diesel exhaust fluid called DEF. None of them are yet reporting on shortages in diesel engine oil. It takes three things to run a diesel engine. Diesel, diesel engine oil, and diesel exhaust fluid, DEF. Why is this important? If we don't have all three, there will be no food in the grocery stores, and our entire economy will come to a halt. Yes, isn't this interesting? It all comes down to diesel. Diesel, diesel oil, diesel exhaust fluid. I will explain. Let's look at the magnitude of this issue. What is at stake is food and the desperate measures people will go to if this happens in order to avoid starvation. Food is grown on farms. All equipment on farms runs on diesel. Tractors, combines, loaders, sprayers, etc. Trucks are used to transport food from farms to processing plants to warehouses to retailers. Trains all run on diesel. Trains deliver coal to coal plants for electricity. Much of our energy is derived from coal. I know in the Western United States, uh, energy is typically derived from hydroelectric power, and, but that's kind of an anomaly for the world. Most of the world and the rest of the US typically relies on coal for its energy. Ships all run on diesel. The magnitude of this is there are 11 million trucks in the U.S., 4 million diesel tractors, 55,000 cargo ships in the world, and 26,000 diesel locomotives in the U.S. If there's no diesel or DEF, there's no food. 
but diesel and DEF are not the problem. There appears to be enough diesel and DEF, but no diesel engine oil, also no food. It is very significant if this is true or partially true. Our food supply and everything in our economy will absolutely collapse. There are alternative websites and sources that are reporting anecdotal evidence that there is an increasing shortage of diesel engine oil. There are definitely an increasing number of reports that truckers are finding it harder and harder to get the diesel engine oil needed to keep their trucks running. Apparently, there is an adequate supply of oil itself but the shortages are in the chemical additives that go into the diesel engine oil, such as rust inhibitors, defoamers, uh, dispersing agents, and other chemicals. If this continues, and I will say if, if this continues and expands into a crisis, our very access to food will also go into a crisis mode. At that point, we won't be dealing with food being too expensive. We will be dealing with the issue of no food. I do not want to frighten you. Like everything I cover, I always end with, so what can you do about it? So my thoughts are, get prepared in food and energy as best you can. Think defensively in each area of your life instead of just going along thinking that tomorrow will be the same as today. Watch out for buy and hold investment portfolios. They will again be at risk if there is a food crisis. You can invest in the market, but do it tactically. That is how we do it. Keep an eye out for news that starts to cover this. If it is a problem, which I'm reading that it looks like it's emerging into a problem, uh, the news outlets will start to cover it more. And search out alternative sources of information. Last week I covered the story of Joseph in ancient Egypt and uh, his message uh, to the leadership of the country was get prepared. Put aside some food every year for the next seven years. Live on 80%, put 20% aside, and hopefully there will be enough uh, for the following seven years, which he said, according to his uh, the interpretation of the dream, was going to be famine. And of course it was famine. But his thinking defensively and organizing a plan to have enough food during a crisis period is what saved the nation of Egypt and the foundation of the nation of Israel. As Americans tackle accelerating inflation, skyrocketing gas prices and food shortages, Manufacturing plants are mysteriously being burned down on a regular basis. In 2021, Resilink, a leading global supply chain monitoring and risk management firm that has been tracking disruptions at manufacturing plants for over a decade, was prompted to create a war room to track the sudden uptick of supply chain disruptions. The company issued over 11 thousand alerts about supply chain disruptions, an 88% increase uh, in a single year. A spokesman for Resilink said, manufacturing plants aren't actually getting destroyed in the United States. Destructive fires like those raging across food factories across the United States have become suspiciously commonplace around the world. More factory fires occurred in 2021 than in any year in recorded history. Nearly a quarter of the supply chain 
disruptions globally were attributed to a manufacturing plants being set on fire. In the article that I read, uh, there were 102 uh, processing plants where food was destroyed. And I'm not going to read you the 102, but I did pick out some that I thought I would just highlight and mention to you, and then you get a sense for the magnitude of what's happening. The question comes, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking the question comes, why? Why are these plants being destroyed by fire and other modes? Why are the, the uh, access to food being destroyed in America? I don't understand this. Uh, so here's a few. I'll, just, I'll read you some. Uh, this is all in 2022. So I'll just read you the date in 2022. January 31, Whiston Weaver Company, a fertilizer plant with 600 tons of ammonium nitrate inside caught on fire in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. February 4th, Diamond Walnut Growers, a food processing plant, was set aflame and permanently shut down following the fire in Live Oak, California. A fire had broken out at the largest soybean processing and biodiesel plant in Claypool, Indiana. March 4, 294,000 chickens destroyed at a farm in Stoddard, Missouri. March 4, 644,000 chickens destroyed at a farm in Cecil, Maryland. March 8, 243,000 chickens destroyed at a farm in Newcastle, Delaware. March 10, 663,000 chickens destroyed at a farm in Cecil, Maryland. March 10, 915,000 chickens destroyed at a farm in Taylor, Iowa. March 14, 2.7 million chickens destroyed at a farm in Jefferson, Wisconsin. March 17, 5.3 million chickens destroyed at a farm in Buena Vista, Iowa, etc. I won't read you all of these. I mean, they're just, they're all the same. I mean, it's just amazing the magnitude of the hundreds of thousands or millions of um, chickens or turkeys are uh, being destroyed or plants being burned to the ground. According to the FBI's cyber division, cyber attack threats on agricultural cooper uh, cooperatives are an imminent threat. And the director said, and I quote, ransomware actors may be more likely to attack agricultural cooperatives during critical planting and harvest seasons, disrupting operations, causing financial loss, and negatively impacting the food supply chain. So why am I covering this? What, what, ben, what do you, I thought you were into the investments in the stock market and the economy. Well, the reason I'm covering this is because the when you see the magnitude of this, and it doesn't appear coincidental or random, it appears that there's some kind of intent behind it. I just don't know, but I'll say that. The, what's happening is our food supply is going away. And when we add to the issues with diesel, oil, or uh, issues with truckers, I, and you add food supply that's going away, regardless of what the reason is, yes, prices are going sky high, but the bigger issue is, what if we can't get food? What does that do to us personally? And then you can also carry it into the area of economics and finance. But the first thing we care about is surviving. The first thing we care about is that we um, we don't die. We don't die of starvation. We have some kind of access to food. The lack of that would cause mayhem, chaos, riots, maybe civil war. I mean, people are not going to stand still for this. Um, we live, unfortunately, in an entitled entitlement uh, mentality society. And... Um, it just won't go well. So I hope none of this is true, 
But what I see is uh, whether it's the uh, processing plants or the truckers or the diesel, it, you know, it, if anything breaks in the supply chain, it's very fragile. Anything breaks, it, the whole system is at risk. And that means food itself uh, is at risk. The way we're used to living our lives um, in our society. I want to cover some um, charts and some indicators uh, that show what's going on uh, currently and historically with um, the uh, stock market and economy. This is a chart that goes back to 1950, so it is about a 70-year chart. And this is a ratio. The, the blue line is a plotted ratio, which is numerator corporate equities, stock market, if you will. And the denominator is GDP, gross domestic product, the economy, if you will. The stock market divided by the economy, said another way. And you can see and with a red, red regression line drawn through the middle. So you can see that the, over that entire period of time, think of this in a macro way, there are times where the market relative to the economy that supports it is above the line and there are times where it is below the line. And here we are, we've just come off of the last couple of quarters, we've just come off of a period of time where the, uh, econ the stock market was at an all-time high. Let's just say that was uh, December 31. And here we are a couple of quarters later, and you can see the pullback at the very end we think the stock market has come way down. Well, take a look. That's how far down it's come. The stock market divided by the economy. A way of looking at the stock market, the value in the stock market or the value of stocks that is supported by the underlying economy. So yes, we've come down, but look how far we have to go before we even hit the red line. And every time you hit the red line, it always goes below the red line. So we talk about a uh, recession, a contraction in the economy. Um, that's probably what will bring that down. There are ways to evaluate, to, to establish value or valuation of uh, stocks or the stock market. So let's just say uh, the stock market. And the, uh, these are complicated, they're, they're fairly complex and they're not uh, something that most people are focused on. But this, uh, the, the dark red line toward the lower section of the chart is the the mean, and what that means is half of the data is below the mean, half of the data is above the mean. And so you can see by the far right of the chart, yes, we have come down, the values in stocks has come down from its peak, agreed. Look how far away it is from just the mean now, what this blue line represents is an average of four methodologies for valuing stocks. A lot of times we think in terms of price earnings ratio, but there are other methods. And so the blue line is an average of all four methods. So probably a pretty good indicator as far as um, the uh, methodology for valuing stocks. So people say, ask the question, are stocks still overvalued? And matter of fact, I've had conversations with people that say, uh, I think stocks are now starting to get reasonably priced. Well, when you look at this, if you think long term, you think macro, I'm not so sure they're overpriced. Or excuse me, I'm not so sure that there is a bargain. I think it appears they are still overpriced. 
This is a chart that goes back uh, to 1870. So it is, uh, you know, a long ways back, uh, 150 years. And the, it is a line that is blue and red. The blue part of the line represents the, and it's, it's on a, uh, an inflation adjusted uh, basis. And you can see that the uh, blue line goes up, that's a bull market. The red line comes down, that's a bear market. There are four bear markets in the past 150 years. There are five bull markets. So bull market, bear market, etc. And here we are at the end of a bull market cycle. Or we think it's the end. So if this goes into a bear market, and actually we're already in bear market territory, so I think the end of this line is going to turn red. That's my opinion. And if it does, uh, this would be would spell the beginning of a long-term macro bear market. Probably a lot of times they last 10 or 15 years. Uh, maybe the Great Depression lasted longer, but uh, most of them last 10 to 15 years. Uh, so uh, I would say if we're entering a new uh, secular long-term bear market, uh, the stage is set and maybe this or for that to occur and maybe the end of this line uh, that's now blue will actually turn red and we will be able to look back and say this was the beginning of a long-term secular bear market. The one economic indicator I'm going to give you is the um, what's called the inverted yield curve. And this is the, uh, the difference between the, the, the spread between the 10-year government treasury bond and the two-year government treasury bond. When the yield on the two-year, which is normally lower than the 10-year, when the yield on the two-year is higher than the 10-year treasury bond, that is historically, back for 50 years, has historically meant that a recession has followed. When that goes into, when, when the 10 year, when the two year becomes a higher yield than the 10 year. So that occurred earlier in 2022, I believe it was March. And you can see the line came all the way down and went into negative territory. Then it went back up. Now it has come back down into negative territory, again, signaling that we are headed into a recession period. Okay, now I want to cover the uh, dashboards and uh, charts and uh, that indicate the direction of the market, what's going on, and uh, get inside of this. Um, so this is a chart that shows uh, seven different uh, indexes or stocks that tell us a general direction in, from different perspectives in the um, stock market. So on the far right of the chart is what I'm focused on, and the second column is the name of this particular index or stock. In the um, line one, the Dow Industrial Average, for year to date, down 13%. S&P 500, year to date, down 18%. TLT, the 20-year government bond ETF. The ETF, or some version of it, maybe the 10-year ETF, is used to offset equity risk in a stock bond portfolio some version of that. It may not be TLT, a lot of times it is, but it could be the intermediate term or some other form of bond. But this will give you an indication of how bad bonds have been and how bad portfolios have been that include bonds, which most of them do. TLT 
down 24% year to date. That is the biggest culprit in investor portfolios today is bonds. NASDAQ 100 down 25%. The technology component of the NASDAQ 100 down 30%. RK Innovation Funds that were once, what, a year ago, were the darling uh, that everybody uh, thought that was going to go to the moon, down 50%. Netflix, down 68%. Here are some other indexes covering a different perspective. And what I'm showing on the right side of the chart are dots. Red dots are green dots. The red dot means that that particular <coughs> um, ETF um, could be you know, an index or something like that, an asset. Uh, that particular asset is above its moving averages or below its moving averages. So from left to right on the dots, green dot or red dot, from left to right, the 20-day moving average, the 50-day moving average, the 100 and the 200. So uh, a green dot indicates that it's probably um, has strength to it, and in this case, usually means it's moving up, at least above that particular moving average, indicating it has some degree of strength. Uh, so going from top to bottom, uh, gold represented by GLD, negative in all, in all four categories. Dow Industrials, one green dot above its 20-day moving average. Emerging Markets, <clears throat> negative on all four. SPY, the S&P 500, positive above its 20-day only. IWM, the Russell 2000 small cap index, above the 20-day moving average only. EFA, the developed markets, uh, negative, below all moving averages. NASDAQ 100, <coughs> excuse me, NASDAQ 100 above its 20-day, Netflix, coming up in the world, above its 20 and its 50-day moving average. And Coinbase, above its 20-day moving average only. <coughs> the S&P 500 is made up of um, sectors. There are 11 sectors, major sectors, in the S&P 500, and these are the 11 sectors, and each of them has its their own <coughs> moving averages, and they're represented by the ETFs for those particular sectors, and the ETFs uh, are on the left, in the left column. There are 10 green dots. 44 possibilities, and 10 of them have become positive. Last week, there were five. So this is positive. This is moving in the right direction. And last week was a positive week, generally speaking. It was a short week. There were four uh, trading days that the market was open, and uh, most equities moved up most of those days. So in many cases, it was a positive week. And that is reflected when you see that these have started to move above, some of them, most of them have moved above their 20-day uh, moving averages. I've shown this before. This is a chart. It's very interesting, and this is a good place to show it. The, this is a picture of the stock market, in this case the Dow, Dow Jones Industrial Average, during the Great Depression. And there's some very important things that I want to point out here and the things that I think we're going to be facing in the future and my view of them. During the Great Depression, the stock market 
did not go down the whole time. It did what it typically does. And this is represented by the black arrow uh, on the left. It went down, but look at it, kind of in a uh, jagged kind of way, like a saw. It goes down, and then it tries to go up, and it can't go up, and it goes down again. It tries to go up, and it goes down again, so forth, exhausting, exhausting itself. But all of the while, it's having these periods of time where it tries to go up. These are short opportunities for making money. The way to make money in this kind of market is to, one, be out of the market because overall it is a negative market. If that were the case, if you were just out of the market completely, nothing wrong with that. That black arrow and the left side of the chart goes from top to bottom, that's a loss of 88% of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, back then, people didn't invest in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. They bought stocks from stockbrokers. Most people, the vast, vast majority of people, lost everything. If someone lost 88%, they would probably be in the category of the lucky part of the crowd. Most people lost everything. But when we look at it, to study it from a little more of a macro view, it would be helpful to look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average to see how that performed. And it went, did not go straight down. It went down in a jagged way. So this is a perfect example of tactical investing. If you're in a, and this is why people lost, most people lost everything, because they were not in tactical investing. They were just doing what people do today. They just put their money in the stock market. The stockbroker says you buy and the market would go down, and, and I can imagine, and there's a lot of stories about this, where the stockbrokers would say, it's going to go back up, because it always did go back up, except this time it didn't go back up. And it will go up until it doesn't. And here's an example of where it doesn't. It goes down and down and down, and the, the, the um, comments from the stockbrokers, today financial advisors, are saying, you know, you can't sell now. You've got to invest for the long run. Uh, this will go on back up. Those become kind of empty when the market has actually a collapse. Now, we don't know if the current market is going to collapse. I've, I've given you some uh, scenarios of what's going on in the economy that are very dark. And, uh, but I began each one of them by saying, if, if this happens, or unless something comes along that changes the course that we may not see today, if something comes along that changes the course, the direction of the market, yeah, it can go up. But right now, uh, everything I'm reading says that uh, from the experts I follow are saying, no, there is more downside to our current market. The thing I wanna show you is this. When you get to the bottom, after the Dow Jones has lost 88% of its value, going to the right, I put three red arrows on here to show you something. Now, this is a numerical chart called an arithmetic chart and not a logarithmic chart. So because it's, 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 um, it's uh, arithmetic, it, it doesn't really say this correctly. So one looks like the first one looks like a little tiny arrow, the next one kind of a medium-sized arrow, and then the, the final one looks like a really big arrow. But let me tell you what's behind that. That little arrow at the very bottom, that's when the market hit bottom and then immediately it went up because it was exhausted. But it doesn't go up like that until it is exhausted. The rise of that small arrow is a rise from about $41 to about $75. That is an 82% increase an 82% increase in, what is that, a couple of months? That's crazy. But who had money? Nearly everybody was wiped out. And if they were not wiped out financially, they were wiped out emotionally. They had no stomach for investing. But yet, look at that huge opportunity. Again, I come back to tactical investing. Taking advantage of this, 
not trying to pick the bottom, not trying to pick the top. Just I'm going to be in when mathematically it makes sense for me to be in, and I'm going to be out when it makes sense for me to be out. The traditional invest, investment advisor, financial advisor, they don't believe in that. They just believe in writing it all the way down. And if it goes back up, whenever it goes back up, uh, you'll participate in that, whatever you have left. What happened after it went up to that 75 level, look what happened. It turned around and collapsed again. Collapse came all the way back down from 75 down to about 50. That's a pretty big decline. That's about a 33% decline. Then about six months later, it takes off again and goes up about 100%. 100%. I'm just visually looking at that saying that's about four months worth. In about four months, it went up 100%. Who had the stomach for that? Not many, I suspect. And then it went sideways, sort of, up and down, up and down for a couple of years. And then it took off when people were not suspecting it and went up another 100%. So you see the, the all three arrows. One is 82, one's 100, and the th third one's 100. So they're all about 100. But look at the size of them because using a... Um, a numerical chart, it uh, doesn't really do it justice that a uh, logarithmic chart would do. In 1937, the market hit a high, not an all-time high, because it still is a long ways away from its all-time high, but it hit a high for the last five years or so. And then the Second Great Depression, it was literally called the Second Great Depression, occurred in 1937, 1938, and the market collapsed again about 50%. A time when one would want to be out of the market. Great to have made these gains, hopefully, theoretically, tactically, but once those gains are made, nobody was expecting this thing is going to turn around and go back down 50%. That would be a time I would want to be out of the market. I cannot guess that. I'm not that good at that but tactical investing is the way this is done. Really a, a really good chart to show over a long period of time why it is so helpful to be in the market at the right time and so helpful to be out of the market when it is time to be out of the market. By the way, the, this only lasts for about 10 years, but the, the, the bear market that was put in place beginning in 1929 actually went all the way through World War II till about 1945, 1946. So it actually extended about 16, 17 years and then actually started to go back up after the war and did not go back to where it originally started. It took all the way to 1954 to get back to where it originally started. Those who participated in that were probably not the ones who were there in 1929 because they got wiped out. Pretty much all of them got wiped out. So there are opportunities for investing and there are short term and longer term uh, opportunities. These red arrows, another thing, a way to say this is these are um, cyclical bull markets inside of a long-term secular bear market. This bear market lasted a long, long time, all the way until about 1945, 1946. Um, but inside of there were these cycles, these short-term cycles, both uh, secular, or cyclical uh, bulls and cyclical bears. And that's the way they go. And that's the way all long-term secular bear markets work. I've read this before. This is <clears throat> from a, a friend of mine who's a, he's the, it's Med Jones, who's the president of International Institute Manage, of Management and a think tank, an international think tank. And uh, he wrote this following 2008. And it's his observation as a think tank person who's trying to explain behavior um, 
And I, I thought it was just it's very interesting and um, insightful. So I'll read it. There are two main reasons that cause mainstream economists and financial media to miss the financial crisis of 2008, the housing bubble. We remember that. The first is the NIH, not invented here by us, which is an organizational phenomenon manifested in an unwillingness to adopt an idea because it originates from unknown outsiders. In other words, I didn't think of it myself. It is a form of social cognition bias that leads to errors in group judgments, such as missing on new opportunities or risks. The second reason is a cognition bias known as the confirmation bias, which is the tendency to search for, filter in, or interpret information in a way that confirms existing preconceptions. The confirmation bias is recognized as an individual cognition bias, but when met with NIH bias, it appears to develop into a social bias very similar to the groupthink syndrome. And that's what we have. It's not only true in the financial industry, I see it in every industry. I see it in uh, medicine, education, uh, government, business, uh, technology, uh, all forms uh, of um, industry and way, uh, infrastructure in our economy, um, I see that there uh, is the tendency to gravitate to what I call conventional thinking, and that's what he's describing here, conventional thinking. And you can already see, because I'm in the world of investing, you can already see this year uh, the result of people and advisors, people who believed in advisors, they trusted their advisors, and advisors who believed what the industry had taught them for years, and it all led to a collapse. Why? Because they were thinking similarly. I call it an echo chamber. They were all saying the same thing to each other, believing what they were saying, but look at the result. Devastating, and unfortunately, devastating for innocent investors. I'm going to go through some charts. Uh, these are give us a good picture of what's going on. The, the, these are weekly charts, so every move represents one week, whether it's up or down, that's one week. So we can see this is the S&P 500 represented by the ETF SPY. And you can see for the first five or six months, the red arrow shows the S&P 500 representing the broad market rose. And then for the last six or seven months, the black arrow shows that we have been in a macro uh, decline. The market is coming down. All of the previous information I've shown shows the same thing. At the very end of this chart, you see that little tick up? That's last week. Last week was positive, generally speaking, for most investors. But it was one week and not an indication that we are out of a bear market. We're not out of the bear market. Was interesting for me to see this that there was weak volume, there was anemic volume. Each day last week while the market was going up, the volume of buyers and sellers was low, indicating a lack of enthusiasm, which told me and people I follow, we're not entering, this is not the bottom, we're not going up from here. We're probably still in a downward mode uh, the market has not yet hit a bottom. We don't know where it is and when that's going to occur, but I can tell you that little tick up last week was not an indication. It is time to get back in the market. When you break the S&P 500 down into its value kinds of stocks and its growth kinds of stocks, I develop a ratio. I put the numerator as growth and the denominator's value. So in other words, 
if this line is moving up, growth is in favor. And if it's moving down, value is in favor. And clearly for the first four or five months, represented by the red arrow, you can see growth was in favor, more going up more than value. And then it, con it, then it began its decline where growth went out of favor and value was in favor, indicated by this. But again, at the end of the chart, you can see what's happened recently, that growth wants to go back up, but the long-term trend is still in a downward direction for growth, more so than value. The small cap index represented by IWM compared to the S&P 500, the uh, small cap index, Russell 2000 index, is the numerator, SPY, S&P 500 denominator. So if it is going up, that means that the small caps are doing better than the large caps, which is the largest 500 companies in the stock market, which is the S&P 500. So if it's going down, uh, the S&P 500 is outperforming small cap. So in a macro way, you can see for this entire year, the entire year, small cap has underperformed large cap, indicating general weakness in the economy. I get away from the relative strength of one component versus another, or one index versus another, and I look at the long-term government bond, TLT, it's an indication of government bonds in general, but uh, TLT uh, has the highest amount of gains when it is going up and it has the greatest amount of losses when it is going down. But it's a measure of what's going on with government bonds. The red arrow on the left, this is a 24 month chart. So the red arrow on the left shows a pretty long period of decline of the long-term government bond. And then it tried to go back up and then it collapsed. And so for the last six or seven months, the black arrow shows bonds have continued to decline. And this, the black arrow, is a, is a good indication, at least the most recent indication, that the portfolios of investors are declining. They're declining at a rate that investors and financial advisors were not prepared for because they didn't think this was going to happen. Because the playbook says when stocks come down, that black arrow bonds are supposed to go up in some form. It did not happen. And that's what caught them by surprise. Even though all the indications were there, this was going to happen because we were at zero interest rates. Interest rates were starting to go up. And if interest rates go up, that means bond yields go up and that means bond prices come down. That's not a hard mathematical equation. But yet, because it's not in the playbook, it was costly to investors. Gold, a lot of up and down, and this represented by a 24 month chart represented by the ETF GLD, and a lot of up and down, but the short term trend in the past several months, th three or four months, is down. So gold, has come down, although it has been up and down a lot. Um, and then we go to silver, even more so. Silver is weaker right now than gold. If you look at the first, say, 11 months of the past 24, you can see that silver was generally in an upward direction. And uh, since that time, it's generally in a downward direction. I've commented before, and I'll say it again, that I do not look at silver or gold as an investment. I look at them as an insurance policy. I don't care if it goes up or down. It's not the reason I buy it. Uh, maybe if it went down enough, I'd buy some more. But it, it I use it as a um, an, an insurance policy, insurance against the eventual decline of the dollar and a tool to barter with if we ever revert to that. If that doesn't happen, I'll probably never touch my silver. When we do a ratio, we can see that silver favored gold for the first seven or eight months of this chart. 
And since that time, gold has favored, has been uh, more, um, gone down less than silver uh, for a year plus period of time. Volatility index. Uh, cover this because it's a measure of, of stock market volatility. The line uh, on the right, the 24, is an arbitrary number, and uh, the index goes up and down. And the more it goes up, that shows there's increased volatility in the market, meaning generally downward volatility. If it's coming down, that means some of the volatility has come out of the market. It's still above 24, but it has been on a, a decline in the uh, last month or so. Asbury Research does uh, some um, uh, research, some data charts. This is their uh, Asbury 6 metrics, and you can see that of their indicators, four of them are positive and two of them are negative as of um, last Friday. They also do a cross-asset um, uh, relative performance, uh, comparing assets one to another, which one is stronger. If it's strong enough, they give it a green box. If it is just stronger, but not pronounced, it'll be listed, but it will still be in a white box. They look at them <clears throat> in a weekly, monthly, and quarterly view. Again, pretty good set of views for looking at the short term, all the way up to maybe the intermediate term. Uh, the ones that are positive in, in all categories, and these are a little bit surprising. So a lot of them are down, and one is just down less than the other. So again, on a relativity basis. Small cap uh, is stronger than, or uh, small cap is stronger than a large cap for the last week, month, and quarter. We go back further, we'd find the opposite is true. NASDAQ 100, stronger than the S&P, which is the broad market. Again, short run, week, month, quarter. Go back further, it would be the opposite. Growth is in favor over value. Again, longer periods back, the opposite. U.S. Uh, over developed markets. And um, then go all the way down to the very bottom for fixed income, bonds, uh, both short-term bonds and long-term bonds, intermediate term, they're all down, which I've shown you, uh, but short-term are down uh, less than long-term. When they go the other way and they go up, uh, long-term is going to outperform short-term. But in a, when it's in a downward mode, short-term would be down less. That'd be the best way of saying it. <clears throat> this is uh, interesting. This is the first time I've ever seen this chart that looks like this. So this compares the United States with SPY versus the ETFs in the second column for each of the countries listed and some regions of the world. So how are we doing versus other countries? And if it's a white uh, box, that means you know one of them's in favor, but slightly. Not enough, not enough in a pronounced way to give it um, a green box. If it's a green box, that means it's more pronounced. Could be weekly, quarterly, or excuse me, weekly, monthly, or quarterly. So the uh, only two that got a green box at any degree of pronounced movement were the monthly and quarterly for Hong Kong and China. Isn't that interesting? Not a single one, including the U.S., not a single one was pronounced for all three periods. Uh, gold and silver, I've told you those are in a downward uh, mode. Uh, gold uh, was down 4.3% for the week, and silver was down 2.8%. With COVID restrictions being lifted, we can go do all the things we can't afford to do anymore. Guess that's a good way of saying it. Um, thank you for watching. I appreciate uh, all of the comments that people have left. I enjoy those. I try to answer a lot of them. And um, for the people who have reached out, I love to talk to people. So thank you. And um, 
So feel free to leave comments, and thank you again for watching.